We continue analyzing the Ravens' 16 to 13 win over the Bears in Week 11. Next, with a very special guest here on Locked On Ravens. <laughs> You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we return here with another episode of Locked On Ravens. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire. And here with us today on our Taco Tuesday episode to dive into the Ravens 16 to 13 win over the Chicago Bears is Spencer Schultz of Baltimore Beatdown. Spencer, another really heart wrenching game for this team. You know, one of those close matchups goes back and forth. The long touchdown by the Bears, the response by Tyler Huntley, but the Ravens come out on top at seven and three and continue to hold the lead in the AFC North. How are you doing today? Doing quite well. It was a very peculiar game. It reminded me very much so of that Wednesday matinee game where the COVID-19 virus ran right through the Ravens locker room, except it was also the Bears. The Bears were missing some pretty, pretty high level players on their end. So wild, wacky, wet and wonderful game in Chicago. The Ravens pull it out. The heartbreak, the cardiac kids, whatever you want to call them, the heartbreak kids, they get it done again. So Ravens stand at seven and three at this point, first in the AFC North. And now the fun begins with the divisional play coming up. So I'm doing fantastic. It was a great day. I, I won a lot of money yesterday for the first time this year, it felt like on some props and some lines and some things of that nature. So I'm uh, doing quite well. Glad to be back for another Taco Tuesday talking ball. Yeah, glad to have you back. And everybody loves winning money. So I'm happy you were able to win some cash on this week. But, you know, talking about this game, Spencer. There was uh, there are a lot of storylines. Obviously, the, one of the bigger ones being that Lamar Jackson missed this game with an illness. His first missed game due to a non-COVID related issue outside of rest. You know, was never injured, never had an illness like that. That wasn't COVID, but he misses the game. Tyler Huntley gets the start, and again, you know, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't perfect, but all things considered, I thought he impressed overall. Twenty six to thirty six, two hundred nineteen yards to throw an interception, contributed seven carries for forty yards on the ground, and of course that game winning drive. I mean, five plays. Yeah, it happened in a minute and nineteen seconds, and the Ravens get the win. How did you think Huntley performed? All things considered, in his first NFL start, I think that Huntley showed kind of a progression of what we've seen loosely, just based off of preseason and the limited action that he's had. Early in the preseason and at times, he he can really throw some darts underneath, some some really high-velocity throws underneath, and uh, we see him do that, which feels like at times to avoid the possibility of interception, throw it hard enough that the defense, defense won't catch it. We see him have some misfires for sure. Pat Ricard on a screen that was wide open. He kind of throws him a bullet from a couple yards away when he didn't need to. Uh, we saw him, you know, Mark Andrews bailed him out with a fantastic catch at one point, not that he's – Never done that for Lamar Jackson, which he does all the time. That's why he gets paid the big bucks. Uh, and he, he had some misfires in this one. But as the game wore on, it felt like he started to put a little bit more touch on the ball. He does throw an interception, which there was a lot of controversy about that play call and things of that nature. Well, I, I thought it was a nice play call. It was a sprint out. So you split the field in half. You use your mobile quarterback. You have a lot of protection there. And you give your mobile quarterback the option to throw the ball away, hit the open receiver, or scramble. So those are three pretty high you know, percentage options in terms of or I guess safe options and bing bam boom ball hits off of Mark Andrews ends up with a a Bears defender laying flat on their back and the ball falls into his belly while he's not even attempting to catch the ball rolls into his arm uh, like a gift from the heavens so uh, that one was funny you had to appreciate this game overall for the comedic factor and we'll talk about Andy Dalton coming in and what that must have felt like or did feel like for Ravens fans but Huntley overall Got the job done late in the game. It felt like he had a lull there around the third quarter where he was taking a lot of sacks and wasn't pushing the ball out effectively. He was struggling to push the ball downfield. And it was like, oh, well, here we go. The UDFA backup is really starting to struggle. You know, you could have watched them not score the rest of the game and been like, yep, that would have made sense. But they rebounded really well. He had several really nice drives. He went nine for nine at one point in this game, hit nine consecutive passes. I think it was uh, then like 10 out of 11 at one point as well. So, uh, he, he, had, he had a nice rhythm at certain points. He did a couple things that I think Lamar Jackson can take away from this game and be like, okay. Uh, one of those things being the Bears blitzed, obviously, more than any team. They blitzed more than the Dolphins blitzed. They blitzed more than any team ever has in the like next-gen stats era going back like five or six years. 
blitzed him on like 65% of dropbacks, something around there. And I think he did a nice job a couple of times of, we will see Lamar Jackson with the unblocked defender or an, an end or a DB. And he tries to pump and then sidearm and it throws the timing of the playoff a little bit. And uh, just, it, it leads to inaccuracy. And instead Tyler Huntley, who's about the same height as Lamar Jackson stood tall and raised his arm up and made himself throwing off of a tall platform over top of those defenders and putting just a little touch on it and doing it quickly. Getting the ball out quickly was something that I think Huntley did well in this game. He wasn't terribly accurate at times, but he got the ball out quickly and that helped negate the blitz. And I think that's something Lamar Jackson can take away overall. Um, again, the, the same kind of struggles that we've seen from Lamar as well, taking sacks you don't need to take running around a little bit more than just throwing the ball away. And sometimes, you know, the best play is a throwaway. A lot of times, actually. So that's that's something that, you know, you hear coaches always say about young quarterbacks. The best play is to take nothing and also give nothing away. So not losing yards. You know, something that they can learn from that Lamar Jackson needs to get better at, that Huntley needs to get better at. But again, I, I think there's a couple nice aspects there that uh, you, you can take away. And also late in the game, generally, you can do subjective adjectives I'd say that you can't really measure, but you love in a backup quarterback. And I'd say Huntley kind of reminds me of Taylor Heineke a little bit in ways. Um, gritty, quick, has some mobility to him so he can create for himself a little bit. You can use him in the run game a little bit and didn't bow down to pressure. Didn't fluff, get flustered. Didn't get erratic. He got more calm. He threw more accurate passes, more catchable balls late in that game. Leads back-to-back -back scoring drives. Caps the game off with a touchdown. Uh, was was doing some really nice things as a backup, as a guy who's never started before uh, in the NFL, uh, as a guy who's played what maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 snaps of football prior to this. So I'm I'm not coming in here and saying, oh, you know, they've got you know one of the best backups in the NFL, but I'm not telling you they have one of the worst ones. He's a young quarterback. He's mobile. He's tough. The locker room loves him. You see how all the guys are so happy for him. And you also then see Trace McSorley get picked off on the waiver wire today. And Tyler Huntley is immediately tweeting like an angry thing, saying basically insinuating, I'm so pissed that they stole my friend. This sucks. So he's a locker room guy. He's a team guy. He's got that mojo, that moxie, that grit, all that backup quarterback, all the buzzwords we like in backup quarterbacks. Um, so was he perfect? No, but he got the job done. And that's all you can ask of a backup quarterback. Uh, so at the end of the day, Great job by Tyler Huntley. I think he's going to be the backup as long as he wants to be. And in the words of the Pardon My Take podcast, the best thing he could do right now might be to, you know, fake an injury and see if he can sign like a $20 million contract after you get that, that one spot start. Your value is never higher than that as a backup quarterback, but that's just a joke they like and I always think is funny. No, yeah, this was a game. I, th I think Tyler Huntley showed that he he is the right person to be backing up Lamar Jackson right now. You know, I think that as you said, Spencer, this isn't like the best backup in the league or anything, but he showed some poise and especially under pressure. You know, yes, the Ravens only scored one touchdown. It came really late, but I think overall there were some positives to take away for Huntley and also some things he can grow and learn on as well. But the run game is another area, Spencer, that I want to touch with you on because outside of Huntley, you know, he had those seven carries for 40 yards. No Ravens rusher averaged more than 3.2 yards per carry. And obviously this team misses J.K. Dobbins. They miss Gus Edwards, and it's understandable that they do. But at this point, you know, we're almost three months into the regular season, and there just hasn't been a ton of improvement. And look, this Ravens team, you look at the box score stats, they're like 10th in every cat, or top 10 in every category with the run offense. But if you're watching them, you see just like something isn't right. Devonta Freeman has looked better than he did at the beginning of the season. I think he's definitely improved. Latavius Murray, you know, a north-south runner at this point, you know, more of a Gus Edwards type player, can also do some stuff out of the backfield. They did not have Tyson Williams attempt to carry in this game, despite being active. So Spencer, where are you on this running game right now? Are there opportunities in areas where they can improve? And do you think they can do that? Or do you think that with the running backs and the offensive line, this is just where they are right now until Dobbins, Edwards, and even guys like Ronnie Stanley come back. Well, the one area I would say that Devontae Freeman specifically, first of all, has improved. And I think a reason they like him very much so is I would say the only other running back that I've seen in the Lamar Jackson era so definitively get to the flats with urgency and be ball ready was Mark Ingram. And I think that's a big reason why they like Devontae Freeman. He understands what he is supposed to do, especially on passing downs. He's been a nice factor over the last couple of weeks in the passing game. He's picked up some first downs. He also makes guys miss. He had a team high three missed tackles forced in this game. 
he does not have any runaway speed anymore. He doesn't have a fifth gear like he used to have when he was chewing up the Patriots in the first half of uh, that Super Bowl. But he still can jump cut really effectively. He stays super neutral. I haven't really seen anything where I think, ah, what the hell is Devontae Freeman doing? He just doesn't have the same juice that he used to have as we watch Tom Brady, the 44-year-old uh, scramble for 11 yards. But we know that he doesn't have juice. Is he going to get faster? Probably not. But he's going to continue to feel more confident in this offense. He's doing a nice job in the pass game. He makes guys miss. And I think the combination of him and Latavius Murray, who, like you said, is a north and south runner, another pro, a guy who, knock on wood, bop, 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 has not fumbled takes care of the ball, is solid in pass, bro. He's a big back. And they've been converting in power situations. In other words, third or fourth and two or less, those got to have it runs at a really high rate still. And Gus Edwards was the best runner in the NFL over the last decade or is the best runner in the NFL over the last decade, converts 90% of those situations. The next highest is Ezekiel Elliott at 85 over the last decades. So that's a pretty high margin for Gus Edwards, but nice substitution there. We see Pat Ricard take a carry here, which was awesome. Uh, Tyson Williams at this point, you know, what we've heard and trying to piece it together over time. And I think the biggest indication of where they're at with Tyson Williams is the fact that he's only had four special team snaps this entire season. And Justice Hill, a guy who had 50 something touches last year, was a great special teams player. He's been a returner for them. He's a really strong gunner. He's made plays. He's made tackles. And they started giving him some carries at certain points in time. They trusted him with the workload. And it feels like they don't love the effort that they're getting out of Tyson Williams. I, I don't want to say that he's not a hard worker or anything or say anything derogatory about him, but that's just kind of the bits and pieces that we've heard from Roman and heard from Harbaugh that he needs to do everything well. That he needs to play through the whistle that uh, he needs to maybe not run out of bounds on, you know, two yards away from a first down marker against the Viking or against, excuse me, the Bengals in a key situation. So I think that they're not in love with, with the effort that he's put forth, but th th that's just me trying to, Maybe, maybe I'm reaching there, but that's me trying to piece together the comments that we've heard throughout the season, not aligning with the skill that we saw from Tyson Williams in the preseason. He does also have the big run against the Raiders, which should have gone for like maybe 12 or 13 yards, but he ends up taking to the house. So he's, he's flashed a couple nice plays, but it feels like he's, he's in that doghouse. They don't love the effort that's getting put forth, and I, I'm not sure if he's ever going to be a factor at this point. But with those two veterans, you know what you've got. Uh, they also have Nate McCrary. We'll see if, if he can ever turn into anything. To me, he, he definitely probably has the most juice of any back on this team in terms of having a fifth and maybe sixth gear. Uh, the guy that they liked on special teams seemingly. But at this point, it feels like they're going to run Freeman and Murray until the, you know, until the lights to come on, until uh, the dogs come home. So those are the backs they have. They aren't reeling off big runs unless they're completely blocked up. That's been the case. And they're going to continue being, you know, successful but never electric in this offense they're going to continue being able to convert when they need to get you six yards when you need six yards get you four yards when you need four yards we're just not going to see a lot of 25 when you need five we're not going to see any 75 yard runs out of them um, they're going to get caught from behind but Devontae freeman makes guys miss i love the jump cuts i see i love the vision and latavius murray can put his head down and, and go get you yards when you need him he's a big strong hulking back that has some you know he's a he's almost like an old version of Leonard Fournette at this point in his career as we're watching this Bucks game. He, he's not the most laterally quick player. He, he's not a guy who's going to shake and bake and make guys miss, but got a little bit of runaway speed. We saw that on a Broncos touchdown quite a while back, and I, I like the physicality he brings. I like his kind of zombie or shark-like mentality where on third and one, he is going to hit the hole he is supposed to hit and not even have a single doubt in his mind that he's going to hit that hole. He is completely almost brain dead in those situations. And that's what I like in a power running back. Hit the hole you're supposed to hit with no hesitation as hard as you can and see if you can't go move that pile because you're 230, 240 pounds, probably squat 700 pounds and are a beast. So I like those things. We're just not going to see the big plays. Yeah, and I think people have gotten so used to over the past couple of seasons seeing such a dominant run offense that even when the run game is doing decently well, it's not – nearly enough and and i think that they still have a lot of areas to improve in but i've been impressed with what i've seen from freeman i think murray plays a role but it's just not going to be what it was with dobbins and edwards we'll head into our first break that when we get back we'll be talking about the ravens defense in their 16 to 13 win over chicago so stay tuned for that and we'll be right back we've returned here it's our second segment 
of this Tuesday edition of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Oshaker still here with Spencer Schultz of Baltimore Beatdown. And Spencer, it seems like for this Ravens defense, I mean, they've only allowed three offensive touchdowns for the past two weeks, but their performance has been, I think, a little marred by big plays and the ability to, I guess, or the inability, I'll say, to really stop them. So before we get into that and the controversy that really was in this game towards the end, I do want to talk about Tyus Bowser, who really had, I guess, his coming out party of the 2021 season, all things considered. Five total tackles, two sacks all over the field. This is something where Bowser's played, I think, solid football, but it's not has not had that box score impact. But this was one of those games where he played really well. What did you see out of him, and, and what are you looking forward to seeing out of him in the future? Tyus Bowser is a player that can do it all. That's why the Ravens re-signed him in this season so far. According to Pro Football Focus, Bowser has had 121 coverage snaps, which would be the most of any Ravens linebacker uh, other than himself last year. He is on pace to shatter what he did last year. He's played 435 total snaps this year, played 582 last year. Uh, he's had a very high involvement the last couple of games, 49 snaps against the Bears, 47 against Miami. He's played at least 40 snaps in each of the last four games. It feels like they're starting to rely on him a little bit more, but we've uh, we've seen him start to juice up the pass rush a little bit. Last week against Miami, six pressures. He had 30 pass rushes against Miami, six pressures, like I said, three quarterback hits, and letting him get after it eventually. Uh, he posted probably the best or second best game of his career in terms of rushing the passer. He also had a key tackle on Justin Fields in the open field. We know what he can do in coverage. The one area that Tyus Bowser I was worried about heading into this year was missed tackles. Uh, some, that's something that's continued to plague him just a little, but he's definitely ranged it in or re, uh, reined it in. Week one has two missed tackles. Week three has three missed tackles. He's had three missed tackles over the last six games now at this point. So him and Patrick Queen, two of the kind of poster boys for the tackling woes that the Ravens had uh, earlier in the season. And Patrick Queen has not missed a tackle in like five or six games either. So they've done a better job settling down, being calm, getting after it, and doing a good job. I, I like Tyus Bowser's speed rip. I also think that he's really improved his hand placement and his bull rush, a guy that can really bull rush. Uh, we've seen it quite a few times now. Doesn't always result in sacks. He was really beating up on the Steelers last year in that uh, matinee game that I was referring to on Wednesday. We saw him uh, really starting to, to dent in their pocket. So moving forward, he's a great coverage linebacker, and, and that's why they love him so much. He has, a, you know, a, a, has done a great job in coverage overall. He's let up seven catches for 112 yards so far this year in 121 coverage snaps. So doing a pretty good job there. Uh, we've seen him do things like mark Kareem Hunt in the open field and underneath and be able to get pass breakups previously. So we know what we're going to get there, but uh, an ascending pass rusher continuing to ascend, and we'd like to see him rush a little bit more. He has only rushed the passer 20 times in a game in four of the Ravens' 10 games so far this year. So I think he's definitely starting to really cement himself and peak at the right time. He's at the age and experience level, you know, in his fifth year now where he's not a rookie that's going to wear down and hit that kind of rookie wall. How long is this season? My gosh. Uh, and he's, he's not old. He hasn't had you know, really been banged up, knock on wood, one of the few players that hasn't really missed any practices or time, always puts in a ton of effort and hustle. And I love what I see from Tyus Bowser. I think it was a great signing, a value signing. He leads the Ravens in sacks now, five sacks tied with Justin Houston. Uh, he has, I think, as many pressures this year already as he did last year. His six less than he had last year. So he's on pace to have a career high in sacks, career high in pressures. He's already tied his career high in sacks, I believe. So starting to step up. The Ravens put their faith in him. Let guys like Yannick Ngakwe and Matt Judon walk. Judon's obviously balling out in New England. Uh, but I kind of look to see what, Bowser does over in Gakwe a little bit too over the next couple of years, but at early returns on it, heck of a player has two multi-sack games so far. Let's see if he can do it against some kind of premier competition. It was against the lions and the bears, uh, four of his five sacks, one of them coming against the Bengals as well. So at this point, let's see if he can go beat up on a higher level tackle at some point, he's going to have a few of them down the stretch here. And I, lo I love what I see out of Tyus Bowser. I think he's peaking at the right time. I think he's starting to get hot. And it's time for him to continue to step up and be a leader on this defense when they desperately need one. Yeah, I've been very impressed with Bowser as well. And it's not always the box score stats that, you know, can determine, oh, this player's playing well, this player isn't playing well. I think Bowser really is one of those players where you have to look beyond the box score to see the impact he's making. And that's really for a bunch of these Ravens defenders as well. But Spencer, there was some controversy at the end of this game for the Ravens, specifically on that fourth and eleven. 
where the Ravens decide to send all out pressure. They leave their corners in one on one situations. And ultimately, Chris Westry falls with a double move. The Bears wide receiver Marquise Goodwin ends up burning Westry and scoring a touchdown. It gives the Ravens enough time to score a touchdown of their own and respond. But there's been a lot of opinions as to just should the Ravens have sent that pressure? Should they have put some safety help over top? You know, why are they sending everybody in a situation like that? You know, John Harbaugh's talked a bit about it. And and this whole thing is really getting a ton of attention. So I wanted to ask you about it and get your thoughts on if you thought that was the right play call by Don Martindale. Obviously, for me at least, I, I pin it 50% play call, 50% execution. You know, sometimes they're just bad play calls. Sometimes they're just very poor execution. But a lot of the time, it falls on both. It's not just a play call. It's not just execution. So what are your thoughts on that sequence, Spencer? Do you think it was the right call by Zon Martin to send that pressure? Well, I would like to first say that if you're one of the people that looks and says, man, you don't have Marcus Peters. You don't have Anthony Averett. You don't have Jimmy Smith. You don't have Deshaun Elliott. Why don't you, in that situation with the game on the line, maybe play it a little bit more conservatively. Maybe run a you know four man pass rush, drop seven into coverage, and see if you can play zone and sit back. I completely understand that. I hear the logic; it is there, it is sound. The Ravens' logic is this: they have been a team that relies on positionless defenders, on being able to blitz from anywhere on the field, and on press man coverage to pair with it. Think about the defensive coordinator as well as a person. Don Wink Martindale is a former. Big rig, 18-wheel truck driver as a career. He has a gold chain. He has a gray mullet. He wears Jordans almost exclusively. He is a big, hulking dude who is a badass and is the kind of guy that likes to drive golf balls far, eat big steaks, and drink whiskey. If you're playing him in poker and you're in the final two, what do you think he's going to do when he when, when you know the game is on the line? You think he's going he's gonna to fold and let you pick him apart? No, he's probably going to push his chips to the center. And that is the philosophy of Rex Ryan, who he coached under and with and has worked with. And Rex Ryan, arguably the greatest defensive coordinator in Ravens history. That's their philosophy. That is a moral constitution that they have as a football coach. They're going to rely on the blitz. They want to confuse pass protection. They also trust their players. Players love Don Martindale. Would you rather coach for someone, or excuse me, would you rather play for someone who... Game is on the line. You got Marlon Humphrey out there. Okay, you're fine with that. You got Tavon Young over there. Okay, you're fine with that. And they got this guy, Chris Westry. They love Chris Westry. Ravens fans loved Chris Westry all offseason. Is he Marcus Peters? No. Anthony Averett, you like him better. But he's a six foot four corner, runs four three, doesn't have a ton of experience. And guess what Wink Martindale did? He put complete and total faith in him with the game on the line. Guess who probably loved that? Chris Westry. Now, we can also go back and look at, well, it's a different defense, but just trying to add a little context. The Indianapolis Colts come to Baltimore. They have multiple three-score leads in Baltimore in that game. They have a beat-up secondary. Xavier Rhodes goes down. They, I think that three of their four defensive backs go down at one point. And what did they do? Sat in basic shells all game. Single high and two high. Basic, cover two, cover four, cover three, a little bit of cover one the entire game they didn't blitz they didn't rush and what did they do they had DeForest Buckner they had some guys that can get after it up front they let those guys get beat they put it on those guys to hold up in coverage for three four five seconds and what happened they ended up losing that game they get picked apart underneath there were tons of easy throws non-stop for the Ravens who end up coming back different team different week whatever you know maybe that'll tick some people off I get it just trying to add a little context a little comparison there so the other aspect of the thinking, the Ravens are arguably the most, if not, you know, at worst, I would say the Browns, the Ravens, and the Eagles are regarded as the three most analytically driven teams in the NFL. Really, the, the, it's a two-horse race between the Browns and the Ravens, especially according to ESPN's uh, executive front office poll, where they polled nothing but front office executives around the NFL, and the results were like, 60% Browns, 35% Ravens, and 5% Eagles in terms of votes for who is the most analytically driven and who does the best work with analytics. So let's talk about the decision-making into the play calling and into the scheme and how analytics affects that. The Ravens were trailing with about a minute and 50 left. It is fourth and 11. The Ravens, when they have sent 
Six or more pass rushers on third or fourth down this year have held opposing passers to two of 10 for 11 yards and one first down on third and fourth down, sending six or more. They want the ball to come out. We've seen this before at the end of games. We've seen Marcus Peters do it. And again, Chris Westry's not Marcus Peters. I get that. But they have done it time and time again. C.J. Mosley gets a game-winning interception. Cover zero. They do it at the end of game. They trust their guys. They don't want Andy Dalton, who has scorned them before, on a four-man rush before Wink Martindale took over in the last game that Wink Martindale was not the Ravens' defensive coordinator, burned them on a four-man rush. Ended their season, ended up getting them Lamar Jackson. So every time Lamar Jackson beats the Bengals, you know, the Bengals can tip their hats to themselves. But we've watched it happen. So essentially, the process of thinking there is that the Ravens also have held opposing teams to 54% completions on third and fourth down when they have blitzed at all. Andy Dalton, you don't want to sit back there. You also don't want your inexperienced corners to have to hold up in coverage for three or four seconds. That's a little worse. So the thinking there is let's force this out. We know the ball is going to come out. And Brandon Stevens messed up a little bit. He, he had to probably ID the running back and determine, is he going to go out? I have to cover him if that is the case. He is my man. Or if not, I have to shoot the gap like a madman. He's inexperienced, so they put trust in Brandon Stevens again. And you're saying, well, the, the, the counter argument there is, of course, well, you shouldn't put trust in those guys. Well, guess what they do? They trust their guys more than you do, more than I do, more than anyone else does. They trust them. The players love it. So the thought process was, let's see if we can get Andy Dalton off platform. Let's see if the six foot four cornerback can play at the sticks and either let up a touchdown or incompletion. We don't want to give up a 20 yard gain. We don't want to let up something short. We don't want them to get into the middle of the field and have a 15 yard gain and be able to run the clock out and kick a field goal. Whether the Bears kicker could make that or not. That's to be determined. Bears kickers have been horrible for as long as they got rid of Robbie Gould. But that was the thought process there. And guess what happened as a result of that call? They get the ball back, go down the field, and score a touchdown as opposed to letting up a first down. So Chris Westry played the sticks. You don't think they're going to have enough time to accurately throw a deep double move. Brandon Stevens doesn't do what he's supposed to exactly. Not to fault him. He's an inexperienced player who needs experience and is relatively new to the position. So Chris Westry probably going to learn from it. Brandon Stevens probably going to learn from it. And for all we know, they told Chris Westry, don't, you know, play inside leverage. Don't let up something quick and inside. Make them, you know, try to hold the ball. See if you can use your incredible prodigious length as a cornerback to disrupt Goodwin at the stem. He wasn't able to, gets beat, lets up a touchdown. Ravens get the ball back, drive down the field and score because they had two timeouts left and they had ample time on the clock still. They lived or they died instead of, you know, playing it safe, playing it cautious. A thing that Wink Martindale, the dude, wearing gold chains and Jordans and mullets and Ricky Henderson Oakley's isn't going to do. That's what they practice all off season. They put faith in their guys. They want to manipulate pass protection. They want to get free rushers. They want to bring pressure from everywhere. And you can call him stubborn because he is, but that's what he morally believes upon. Guess what? The Ravens go play soft against Patrick Mahomes this entire game. Do the Ravens win? Yeah. How many points did they let up? The most that they've let up to, or the second most that they've let up to the Chiefs in the last four years. So it didn't work then. They've had tackling issues. Do you want someone running around in the open field anyway? Probably not. They've had some of those issues. So they push their chips into the middle of the table. They lose the hand, get the ball back, and end up scoring a touchdown. It didn't work. The pendulum swung the other way. They just as easily could have let up a completion, playing soft defense, playing off, playing, dropping seven into coverage. You're still dropping Westry into coverage. You're still dropping Stevens into coverage. You're probably still dropping someone like Geno Stone or Chris Board or Patrick Queen or some of these guys that are inexperienced relatively and asking them to hold up potentially for three or four seconds when the red rocket has come in. You haven't, or the, excuse me, the red rifle has come in. You haven't prepared for him at all. You knock Justin Fields out. Andy Dalton comes in, hits big pass, screen, touchdown, dices you up a little bit. But guess what? The Bears at that point, before that call, were 2 of 11 when the Ravens blitzed them. It was working all game. They went back to that well. And the final thing I'll say is people wanted to disguise the coverage. And sure, I get that. But at the same time, that might lead to a blown coverage when you're starting to move and ask guys to communicate and be able to roll, all of those things. Instead, they said, we're going to go show them what we're about to do. We want Andy Dalton to know that he has to get the ball out quickly. But guess what? Pass rush doesn't get home, does eventually. And the funniest part of the entire thing is, let's say Chris Westry played really good coverage or Andy Dalton feels a little flustered and, and is worried about the cover zero and throws the ball over top or out of bounds or short or whatever it is. 
Odafe Owe still got roughing the passer either way, which might have been worse because it might have allowed them to get a first down, get another five or six yards, get into reasonable field goal range, run the clock down all the way, kick a field goal, and give Tyler Huntley the ball back with maybe 10, 20 seconds left. So could they have done all of those things? Is there logic in saying they should have played soft? Yes, we hear you. Everybody hears you. That We, we get it. But at this point, this, there's just this very sour fan base against Wink Martindale at this point. Number one, the defensive coordinator who's allowed the least amount of points in the NFL since he took over in 2018. And number two against Greg Roman, who has scored the most points in the NFL since he took over as offensive coordinator in 2018. So those things, you know, Lamar Jackson's been great. Wink's had a really expensive defense. Of course, there's going to be counterpoints to those. But you're a lot of this fan base feels like they're essentially upset that these guys aren't getting fired or there's not a change or they want them gone. That's fine. You can say that, get your opinion in, say what you want to say. It's not going to happen. So why don't you just sit back, enjoy the game and know what they're going to do and hope or have faith or, you know, be excited and be like, let's go stop. Go get the sack. Go get the pressure on cover zero. If you're a fan, that is what being a fan is. That's being a fanatic of the team. Someone who has belief in their guys has belief in the team. Ultimately you have every right to, you know, get angry and upset and want change and this, that, and the other, but you're, you're barking to a team that's seven and three, despite having $62 million on injured reserve that just won a game without their starting quarterback, their franchise quarterback, their MVP quarterback, Tyler Huntley in his first start on the road in Chicago gets it done. And, and people are still just very, 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 very bitter and upset. So I hear it at some point, just let it go. Enjoy the ride. The Ravens are on a roller coaster of emotions. They're doing Justin Tucker hits a 66 yarder after a fourth and 19 conversion. Odafe away punches a ball out against the chiefs. You know, they come back against the Colts. They come back against the Vikings. They shred them in the second half. They're doing things late in games. They play in a thrilling game against the Las Vegas Raiders. You know, they're, they're living and dying against the Cincinnati Bengals where they had a lead in the third quarter. These games are exciting. They're fun. Enjoy the ride. Wink Martindale is probably going to run cover zero a lot as he always does, as Rex Ryan always did. They're from the same tree. So if you don't like it, you don't like it. You don't have to keep continuing to beat and beat and beat that you hate it. You hate it. We get it. You hate it. You hate when your mom makes a, a roast chicken. Well, guess what? Your mom makes roast chicken. How many times are you going to say you don't like it? She's probably still going to cook. So at the end of the day, enjoy the ride. That's all I have to say on it. Yeah, tons of varying opinions out there for sure. And in what this t team has shown, the coordinators have shown, is that, look, they will live and die by their philosophies. And that's not to say they don't make adjustments in game or they're going to stick to it so much where if it's not working, it's not working, all of a sudden they're just going to keep doing it. But, you know, the team will definitely live and die by their or ordeals, as I think a lot of teams do. You know, this isn't just a, a Greg Roman or Don Martindale or whoever type thing. And it is very difficult to, I think, reshape a team after firing a coordinator you know it's not just night and day where all of a sudden like you know greg roman is gone and then the offense is you know really good again you know it takes time to get those things into full motion so we'll see what ends up happening you know don martindale is a good defensive coordinator you know he he has situations where he blitzes in and obviously that fourth and 11 play was one of them we'll head into our final break though when we get back We'll be diving into what's up next for the Ravens, talking about their Week 12 matchup with the Cleveland Browns. So stay tuned for that, and we'll be right back. It's Thanksgiving, and we all know what that means. It's football, and nothing goes better with football than turkey and betting. Bet online as you cover it all holiday season. More props, odds, and lies than ever before. Bet online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this Thanksgiving. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website two times a day and receive your fifty percent welcome bonus with promo code Locked On to receive that bonus. And it's not just football. Bet online has pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, even your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online. We're stuffed with deals this Thanksgiving. We return here. Our final segment of this Locked on Ravens episode on Tuesday. Kevin Ostriker still here with Spencer Schultz. And Spencer, we, we talked about the Ravens and the Bears game, but let's look ahead a little bit as the Ravens are scheduled to take on the Cleveland Browns in their second divisional game of the year. The first one obviously being the Week 7 loss to Cincinnati. And this is a game on Sunday night football in prime time. These Ravens and Browns games have been a bit interesting over the last couple of seasons. You know, the divisional games always have an extra bit of oomph to them. How do you see this one going? And how do you think Baltimore matches up with a Cleveland team that has gone through a bit of injury woes themselves? Well, Baker Mayfield seems to be playing injured as opposed to playing hurt. Torn labrum. Deep bone bruise on his knee, has a heel issue. He is limping as he is running, which adds a little bit of exciting wiggle to his runs. It makes him almost a little unpredictable. 
the Browns passing game has been absolutely anemic. They have a big day against the Bengals a bit and expose some things. The Bengals are going into a bye. Those games tend to happen as teams, uh, especially in the AFC North, are getting ready for a bye. And the Browns are ready for them. They had a, a great capacity to hold up and run the ball and, and push the ball downfield and had a great day there and all of those different aspects. But at some point, Baker Mayfield continues to take a beating. I am not shocked in this game if a Ravens pass rush that has been starting to really get after it a little bit, Justin Houston, Ty Bowser, Adafi Away, Justin Matabike, all having a lot of quarterback hits over the last couple of weeks. If they knock at Baker Mayfield out of this game and Case Keenum has to come in because Baker is playing injured uh, in a contract year and trying to prove himself and be gritty and push his team forward and be the leader, be the captain, all that good stuff. Uh, offensively, Nick Chubb, what do you what do you have to say about the guy? Him, Jonathan Taylor with Derrick Henry out, probably the two best running backs in the league. He is a horse. He is an absolute elite level running back that can run through you, around you, and past you, and everything in between. So the task is going to be there. The Ravens know the task at hand against that boot, zone boot offense uh, that I like to call the offense that like the Vikings and the Titans and the Browns run. Uh, very, very heavy zone outside zone scheme where you boot off of it, have quarterbacks that are, you know, good on the run a little bit and can, you can kind of split some of the fields in half and give them more defined reads guys that have deep ball accuracy. Typically, although Baker's been struggling this year, uh, those, those are the similar offenses. So that's why the Ravens went and got a guy like Calais Campbell. That's why they got a guy like Justin Matabike. They, that's why they unfortunately got a guy like Derek Wolf, who's been able, unable to go this year. All those guys can really defend against those zone concepts. Well, we saw what happened last year. I mean, the, the Browns have definitely added some talent defensively and have been playing some pretty tough games defensively over the last couple of weeks. But uh, the Ravens know the deal. The Ravens secondary is banged up again. Last year in that game, their defense was really starting to smother the Browns in the first half. The last time these two teams played, uh, they completely shut them out in the beginning of the year. You give the Browns a little bit of a break there because Kevin Stefanski was in week one of a new tenure and a COVID off season. So not quite being prepared week one against the John Harbaugh team. that's returning a lot of guys made sense, but uh, the second game Ravens, you know, Tyus Bowser, who we talked about a lot today, has a big interception, gets the Ravens down there. They score a touchdown and looking pretty bleak. Suddenly Marcus Peters gets hurt. You know, they, they get really thin. They're starting to put some guys out there. They're putting uh, Tremont Williams out there. They're putting uh, De Devontae Harris out there and, uh, very thin secondary started to get beat up a little bit and let up a lot of big plays to the Browns pass catchers and to the running backs out of the backfield, especially Kareem Hunt. So the, the Ravens know the task at hand, the Browns, Kevin Stefanski do a great job incorporating nice screens and some throwbacks. They have a big throwback screen against the Ravens last year. We see Jarvis Landry, I think in wildcat and then throwing, or I can't recall exactly what the play was against the lions, but he ends up running their only touchdown of the game in on uh, like a 20 yard run. So they have the trickeration. They know that Baker Mayfield's playing pretty banged up, and it's it's going to be a tough team. Jadevian Clowney, a big addition for them. That's been a, a great run-stopping defensive end. Miles Garrett, obviously, having an outstanding season. Denzel Ward has had a really strong season. They're looking to get Jeremiah Wusu koromoa back, who I was not terribly high on in the draft process, and a lot of people deemed him to be the Lamar Jackson stopper in the open field, which I thought, you know, if Derwin James can't really stop a Lamar Jackson in the open field, I don't know who can, but uh, Koromoa has looked really strong before his injury, so – We'll see if he comes back and plays at a high level. Uh, they bring in John Johnson, who uh, struggled a lot early in the year, but they also add Greg Newsom, the rookie corner, who's quietly had a really nice season. So this defense is much improved. It feels like they have a really deep defensive line, more talent in the secondary. So it's going to be a tall task, especially if the Ravens uh, can't get, you know, Marquise Brown back or some of these other players. But the, these two teams know each other very well. Everyone in the AFC North has their their plans and their off-season plans and their roster construction crafted to try to beat the Ravens a lot of times. You know, the Bengals, they talked about it. They're building a team to beat Lamar Jackson. They're building a team. They scout them all year. They look over tape in the off-season every single year. Everything uh, that they do, a big part of it is trying to beat those teams. When you're game planning for the Browns, if you're the Steelers, you know, kind of strength on strength, you know what you're getting, but the Ravens are a very different and unique team because of that number eight. So this, these two teams are – matched up, beaten up, uh, physical. It's going to be a, a, a very important game, especially for the Ravens. Uh, the advantage I'd say is that the Browns have not had their bye yet, which they will have next week before playing the Ravens again. So <laughs> going to be a really interesting couple of weeks with the Steelers wedged in the middle of that for the Ravens. But at this point, the Browns are very beaten down and you're curious to see what they're able to do. And I think it's going to be a, a very physical, violent 
uh, night game at M&T Bank Stadium. The Ravens have been on the road a lot lately. And I think that with Thanksgiving being here and a lot of people probably returning home and wanting to go to this game, I think it's going to be a really loud game. And I think that the, the fans will be rocking. Lamar Jackson hopefully is able to, you know, I'm, I'm sure he probably lost a little bit of weight if he's he looked incredibly sick. Every, all the reports are how incredibly sick he was. He couldn't go, you know, how big of a competitor he is. So uh, I'm sure he probably lost a little bit of weight, but if he can get hydrated, at this point, he's you know had a bye recently, had a lot of time to rest. You know, his legs are rested. He had a little bit of a back and a little bit of a hip injury. Uh, you know, everyone was talking about flipping into the end zone and some of the shots he took in that Chiefs game. So he he should hopefully be fresh as long as he can get past that situation. And this Ravens offense is getting back Nick Boyle. They might be able to have Marquise Brown, Sammy Watkins, and Rashad Bateman. Bateman, who's come on really strong, uh, back into this game. They're going to be able to go line up in. 13 and 12 personnel and 22 personnel with Ricard, Boyle, Andrews, you know, put the big back Latavius Murray in there, Lamar Jackson, and add a wide receiver like Rashad Bateman to that and see what he can do. So it's really exciting to see the Browns come to town. It's the most exciting part of the season. The holidays are underway. The cold weather's here, and the Ravens are about to play five divisional games in the next seven, three in a row right now. So this is the Ravens' postseason. It begins now. They are the team with the one-game lead. They need to keep it. You can't let the Browns beat you in Baltimore, go into a bye week, and then you have to go to their place on the road after they just beat you, knowing that they were, you know, kind of limping into a bye week. So uh, you know, the, people can go say, oh, well, the Browns only beat the Ra the Lions by three points. Well, guess what? The Ravens only beat the Lions by two points. So the Steelers struggle with the Lions. So there's all these relative things, but at the end of the day, these teams know each other. It's going to be a chess match. The coaching staffs are going to be uh, an all-out war of attrition. And like I said, the Ravens, might be a little fresher. They had a bye week recently. They had a little bit of time after that Miami game. And if some of these players can get healthy, you know, Ben Cleveland coming back after Ben Powers has really struggled would be nice. Or maybe moving Tyree Phillips to left guard. Patrick McCary getting another week to uh, continue to, you know, feel active on that ankle again. And you're going to be able to use guys like Pat Ricard, Mark Andrews, and Nick Boyle to go bang up against Miles Garrett and Jadevian Clowney and try and slow those guys down, see if you can run the ball a little bit, uh, see if you can use this new and improved pass core that has made a ton of plays in the last couple of games to go take advantage of a Browns team that uh, has struggled to really take away Mark Andrews a lot of the time. So there, there should be some pretty interesting pass plays for the Ravens offense. And if Lamar Jackson's up to the task, I think the Ravens can definitely win this game and sit at eight and three with uh, games in Pittsburgh and in Cleveland on the docket. Yeah. How, how big it would be for this team to be eight and three, especially winning a divisional game. They're own one of the division right now. You know, we, we've talked about it five out of the last seven are against divisional opponents. So as you talked about Spencer, this is a really important stretch. You could argue it is their postseason. You know, it really does start now because if they can't win a lot of these games, they're jeopardizing not only their AFC North lead, but at the same time, you know, we're talking about seeding, you lose that Miami game, you start to lose some divisional games. Where does that put them? This is still a playoff team in my opinion, but they're going to have to really work for their spot for the AFC North championship or that crown as well as their seeding in the playoffs. But that's all that I have you today, Spencer. What's on the docket for you this week? I've got an article in the works just trying to go back and examine kind of a lot of the kind of dog poo that the Ravens have been dealt this season and how they've been able to make lemonade out of it. Looking at John Harbaugh, what he's done, the way, the way these coaches have tried to adjust and use different groupings and alignments to maximize the guys that they do have active and kind of hide this offensive line at times. And uh, then looking at scouting the Browns, I'll be also be doing watch it Wednesday, going back and looking at some of the key plays on the all 22 coaches film on Wednesday you can catch that at the Baltimore Beatdown YouTube. You can always find me at Ravens for Dummies on Twitter as well as on BaltimoreBeatdown.com. And back on the show next Tuesday as I've had the joy of being on Locked on Ravens for Tacos Tuesdays for the last couple of years here and getting to talk to my main man, Kevin. Make sure to give Kevin five stars. If you're an Apple listener, share this podcast with a friend. If you're a listener on any platform, if you're watching on YouTube, do all the likes and the subscribes and everything that YouTubers tell you to do and reward the man who gives you the best daily Ravens coverage. Thank you so much, Kevin, and I will talk to you guys next week. Yeah, thanks so much, Spencer. The, the link to Spencer's work will, of course, be in the description below on YouTube. So be sure to check out the video on YouTube as well as check out Spencer's work. But that's all I have for you today. When we get back here tomorrow, we'll be diving into your mailbag questions. So stay tuned for that, and I will see you tomorrow.